Hi, welcome to the Evil Tester Show. This is our first show and this is our Halloween special because it's going out on October 2017, 30th, 31st thereabouts. Now, this is a audio and visual podcast, so it'll be released as a video and audio. And the reason it's different from my other YouTube videos is this is going to be much more of a magazine style show. We'll have interviews at various times, there's going to be book reviews, the kind of content I don't really cover on my blog or my YouTube videos. And because this is Halloween, we're going to look at kind of spooky stuff or anomalous phenomenon. So in there we're going to cover um, Charles Fort, ghost hunting, uh, Houdini, seances. We'll see what else comes up. But I've been interested in spooky stuff for a long time. I did a talk, a keynote, my first keynote, I think, was at Eurostar 2012, and it was on the topic of, and it was on the topic of unconventional influences, all the things that have influenced me, some of which are spooky things, some of which are magic, because uh, I fully believe that we have to take responsibility for our testing and think about what we're doing. And over the course of that, I've looked at lots of little things, lots of different things that have influenced me and my testing. And I try and relate all of it back to software testing so that I'm trying to massively simplify what I learn and come up with my own models of the world of testing so that I can take responsibility for what I do because fundamentally I care massively about what I'm doing and part of what I learn from are unconventional influences. And what I constantly tell people to do is whatever they're interested in, it doesn't matter, just map it back to testing and keep going back to the source, look in the bibliography and references of what you read to find out who the people you like read. And then you will uncover way more influences than you could possibly imagine. And out of that unconventional influences talk, I'm going to look at the work of Charles Fort and the ghost hunting that I did with the Association of the Scientific Study of Anomalous Phenomenon. Because fundamentally, testing has a long history behind it in terms of we are descendants of everyone that has ever investigated anomalous phenomenon. That includes scientists and fringe scientists, psychics, mentalists, people who do magic, psychologists, all of that stuff maps in to testing. So I want in here to explore anomalous phenomenon in a little bit more detail because we fundamentally are in the uncertainty business. We find and investigate anomalous behavior, anomalous phenomena. We try to reduce uncertainty by doing investigations, but as we do so, we uncover new things that we didn't expect. We uncover new areas of uncertainty, new risks, and that whole notion to me is very important. And a lot of the things that I study are related to anomalous phenomena as a result of that. So I'm going to start by looking at the work of Charles Fort. Charles Fort, I don't know how many of you have read it, this green cover, it might not come through in the video. He wrote a couple of books, four main books, The Book of the Damned, Low, Wild Talents, and New Lands. He also wrote some fiction that I haven't read. But what he was doing is he was collating things out in newspapers, trying to get hold of as much anomalous phenomena as he could to try and make it obvious that there were things that we didn't know and did not understand. So I'm going to jump now to a recording that I made of a practice session for my uh, 2012 keynote where I'm talking about Charles Fort. Charles Fort, for those who don't know, was a writer in the early 1900s who researched, or, or more likely collated, anomalous phenomena, reports of anomalous phenomena. He'd go to the library and, and pore over newspapers and make notes of uh, strange sightings of uh, sea monsters or fish falling from the sky or, or black rain. Or, or anything that didn't fit in with the scientific theories of the day. And he catalogued a lot of reports. When you read his books, if, if you read his books, when I read them, I, I see a man writing with his tongue in cheek. Because when he collates a bunch of stuff that doesn't have a theory, he'll just make one up. He'll just, just for that set of examples, he will create a theory unrelated to anything else. He doesn't attempt to justify his theories, he just splats them down on the page and lets them stand or fall for themselves. Because what's important for him is just the data, the enormous amount of data and that just says, look at all this stuff we don't understand. We do not have explanations for this yet. Therefore, any, any explanation is good enough. Just enjoy yourself, go to town. You don't have enough data, any explanation. Someone do some investigation in this. That's pretty much, I think, what he said. 
and for tea and times does a similar thing. It reports on incidents, preferably with spooky photos, and documents the witness statements and whatever other data or evidence that they have to hand. And sometimes the writers will put forward theories around the particular event, but they have no unified theory for the madness that they report. And their conference gathers together people who do put together unified theories. Conspiracy hunters and ancient astronaut hunters, etc, etc, etc. So you go to their talks and listen politely as, as someone with a worldview very different from your own presents their data and their evidence and their story of their unified theory. And these are like the defects that don't get fixed, the one-offs. The, on, on Tuesday at uh, 14.23, I clicked on file open and got a blue screen of death. Uh, I, on Thursday at 1700, I logged into the system and was spontaneously logged out again. It can't be repeated, it's just a one-off. There's the data. It's my experiential evidence. There it is. Now, I try not to be like the Uncon presenters. I try not to draw a massive web of conspiracy correlation to explain my bug reports. But I'm also cautious that I present enough data to allow investigation. Charles Fort would create the wackiest explanation that he could to surround the data and whatever evidence he found. If it was, if the data and evidence was not specific enough to lead you to investigate in the right place, any old explanation will do. It doesn't matter. It's just, it's just a report of stuff. So I'm wary about explaining defects. You know, the, therefore I conclude that the system has opened a temporal vortex between the production data and the test database. I don't want to do explanations. What I do want to do is document the data, describe the phenomena, uh, present whatever evidence that I have, extrapolate the impact of this should it happen again, determine whether it's repeatable, check whether we can investigate it, what do we have to do to recreate the situations where this happens? I avoid explanations as much as possible because explanations can be wrong. If you get your explanation wrong, no one takes your evidence seriously. Now you can find the books of Charles Fort online at the Mr. X site, resologist.net, and he has all four books and they're annotated in a more detail, or you can buy them, there's bumper backs out there. And very good books, very worth reading, I thoroughly enjoy reading Charles Fort stuff. Or you can go off and find the FRT in Times magazine, which is essentially based on the work of Charles Fort, which has up-to-date um, news items on strange and anomalous phenomena if you are interested in keeping up to date with this stuff because it's Halloween you might want to check it out. So one of the things that I also did when I was getting interested in anomalous phenomena learning how to investigate it because I wanted to find out who can we uh, learn from to investigate things and one of the groups that investigates anomalous phenomena is ASAP. It's a UK uh, ghost hunting or paranormal investigation body and I joined them for a little while. I thoroughly enjoyed reading their newsletters but they had a kind of ghost hunting training course so I went on that. I was armed with propus pills, caffeine tablets to keep me up to date which didn't make me feel particularly well and a torch but it was nothing like the torches they had. They had like massive torches, huge mag light torches Nowadays, they probably have much smaller versions that are even better. Huge amount of equipment, radio equipment, very interesting stuff. I talked about that at the Eurostar keynote as well. So I'll jump back to my practice session for the 2012 Eurostar keynote. Who here goes ghost hunting? Well, I went ghost hunting. I went ghost hunting with the Association for the Scientific Study of Anomalous Phenomena. Um, ASAP is now a UK government recognised professional body. So if you want to be a paranormal investigator in the UK, you can get professional indemnity insurance through them and, and align yourself with their code of ethics for investigating the paranormal. So their website is, is worth a look. They've got lots of hints and tips on how to do this. <clears throat> and through them, uh, we went on a vigil. A vigil is where a group of you, about 15, Go into a place that has had previous anomalous phenomena reported and you vigilize. So you basically you sit in the dark for 30 minutes and wait for something spooky to happen. It's all terribly exciting. And you have to get tooled up for this. 
So Q lessons about test tools, just in case you want something to tie it back to. But there's more. So I was there with my little mag light, and my notebook and pen, and thermal underwear because it gets cold, and I had the presence of mind to take a little seat with me. A little fold-up melt thing. But it squeaked. So I had to sit very still so as not to make any noise, because if you make a noise then someone is going to make a note of your noise in their vigil notes. And thinking it's something spooky. Because you're all working in the same environment, so you all have to be conscious of the work that other people are doing around you. So there was me, Mr. Junior Ghost Hunter, looking around at the other new vigilizers, feeling pretty smug because I had a chair. And then, of course, the professionals come in. I didn't even, I did not know, I did not know that they made mag lights that big. It's like a portable lighthouse. And, and holsters, holsters. This is like some weapon that they carry around. And they had sound activated recording devices and thermometers that track temperature over time so that afterwards they can check if there's any correlation at different time periods. Infrared goggles so they can see things that other people can't see and increase their observation skills. I'm pretty sure they had little chairs and stools built into their belts so that they could sit down at a moment's notice. But I remember two specific parts of the vigil. One in a room and one on the stairs. So in the room, two of us are inside and one person is outside. We're collecting data from multiple perspectives. And I remember making no notes on noises that I heard through the wall. The little torch goes on, scribble, scribble. Nothing else happens. Except I'm on edge with that spooky cold feeling, wanting to turn around but knowing that my chair will squeak. And on the stairs, I was at the top. One person in the middle, and one person on the ground floor. After ten minutes or so of sitting in the dark, and there was a noise. Like a door opening from the middle of the steps. Light on, scribble, scribble, time, make note. Nothing else happens. But this time, I'm glad I wasn't in the middle. And at the end of the video sessions, we all get together to go over the notes we've taken and compare the times with other people's times and see if we recorded anything anomalous or if we could explain it there and then. So the noise through the wall, when we all got together, ceased to be anomalous. That was, in fact, one of the groups shifting themselves around their vigil room. Test data contamination from other people. We had synchronized times when each vigil was supposed to start and finish and apparently they started late. But we didn't know until the end. The stairs, however, was different. It remained spooky. So the person on the bottom of the stairs heard the noise above him coming down through the middle and he was glad he was not further up. I heard the noise in the middle. I was glad I was not in the middle. The person in the middle had the noise from the top, and he was glad he was not on the top. I was on the top. They all heard noises from above them, and I was above them both. Spooky. So that remained anomalous, because there was no opening of doors near me, nor of the person in the middle of the stairs. So that would be the subject of further investigation on future vigils. I think this was the first time... I had had to make notes in the thick of something happening. An accurate time and concise description was really important. So, other ways, let me draw some conclusions and pull this out. Um, the time was important to sync together the multiple observation points. Making multiple observation points over time period was important so you could look back and see what happened. Having it done automatically to make it uh, completely objective was really important. There's no chance to fiddle. It's like when you're syncing up your exploratory testing notes with the, the uh, web proxy logs that you've been automatically gathering to give multiple views on the pheno phenomena that you're experiencing when you're testing. So you can then dive in and sync at a particular point in time with the server logs that you're about to dive into to investigate. So I intersperse my uh, exploratory testing note taking with time a lot. I make notes on what phenomenon I, I see because I don't really get to determine what is uh, what parts are important, which parts are significant until the vigil write-up, until the debriefs that happen later on. 
because something that I've written down in passing may turn out to be something that we need to investigate in the future. And not forgetting monster torches in holsters, which you can use to shine light on things and use for self-defense, which is important if you're in a horror film. Okay, now I want to mention Houdini as well. Houdini was a fantastic character. Every, everyone knows him really as an escape artist, but he was a, a fantastic magician. Did a lot of card work, a lot of uh, sleight of hand. He learned escapology. He also learned um, carnival tricks like regurgitation and sword swallowing so that he could hide keys, things like that. And he was a tremendous personality. He used the lessons to learn from Houdini, or he used to practice enormously. Right? He put himself through hell in order to develop the skills that he had, and he never ever stopped developing his skills. But he brought in information from as many different areas as he possibly could, and he was interested in loads of stuff. So most people think of him as escapologist. They don't realize he flew planes. He was, I think, the third person to fly a plane in Australia. He made lots of films through his own production company and other production companies. And um, there's a fantastic scene in one of his films. It's in his, uh, the master mystery. Yeah, the master mystery. And it was a um, serial, a black and white silent serial. And there's a scene in there where he's tied up hanging from a wall um, and his captor is trying to uh, interrogate him. But Houdini knock, knocks him out by putting his legs around his neck, strangling him essentially. Then when he's unconscious, Houdini's still hanging from the wall. Houdini knocks his shoes and socks off. Then because Houdini has trained his um, toes to be enormously dexterous, as dexterous as his fingers because he's using them to pick locks and do whatever else. He pickpockets the unconscious uh, guard's pocket to get the keys out, which he then uses his toes to put the keys in the door lock, which is opposite him, to open the door to then give him leverage to kind of walk his way up the door and the wall so that he can then untie the rope with his teeth. This is like pure Jackie Chan stuff done in whatever it's 1910, 1915 in the silent movie. Brilliant. And all his films are just massively dexterous, showing his tricks. He's doing escapology throughout them all. Um, fairly dangerous stunts that he did himself. But Houdini also um, did a lot of investigation into psychics. He wrote at least two books. He wrote um, The uh, Mist uh, Miracle Makers, which is looking at... Uh, carnival fear tricks and things and if you're interested in that I thoroughly also recommend Daniel Mannix's Memoirs of a Sword Swallower which is an excellent book on uh, carnival life and learning how he learned how to do sword swallowing excellent book but uh, Houdini covers that in his Miracle Mongers book Houdini also wrote um, several books on magic and tricks uh, Houdini on magic is a compilation book which covers it, which is edited by Walter Gibson, who also wrote the Shadow novels. Um, Walter Gibson was a professional writer and magician. He knew Houdini, worked with Houdini. And Houdini wrote um, a couple of other books related to magic and the way thing, but he also wrote uh, A Magician Among the Spirits, which was his investigation into spiritualism um, and seances, because his mother died, that knocked him... Um, out so he went then went tried to investigate spiritualism in a lot more detail to see if it was true he became friends with conan doyle who was like massively important in the spiritualist movement at that time wrote several books on it they had kind of falling out because he disagreed on it but after houdini died and um, his wife had a annual seance to try and get Houdini back because they had a code word that if Houdini came back then he could reveal that code word and demonstrate life after death and Houdini could have escaped the shackles of um, death by coming back and if you look online on archive.org you'll find a recording of the last seance I'm going to play a little bit of that now and it's worth having a listen to a fan fantastic documentary piece of evidence All oh, thou disembodied spirits those of you that have grown old in the mysterious laws of spirit land, we greet thee. We have gathered here at the appointed time. We have complied with all the requirements to enable all of you to make your presence known. 
members of the spirit world have long known of the intention of this important gathering tonight. All is in readiness. Please now, the time is at hand. Make yourself known to us. Any of you, please, manifest yourself in any way possible. Please let your united strength and knowledge aid Houdini in coming through. It is the spirit of Houdini we wish to contact. Houdini, are you here? Are you here, Houdini? But I do thoroughly recommend um, looking into the life of Houdini because he was just massively skilled, honed his skills to perfection. One of the things he said is, is don't allow yourself to go stale on your act. Keep it fresh for yourself, keep it fresh for the audience, keep your skills up to date, keep boosting this. He tried to share a lot of his information. <laughs> he didn't like it when other people um, shared how he did tricks, but he um, knocked out the competition by explaining how they did tricks. And magicians generally write books on how to do magic because they're trying to misdirect what they do, but also help the next generation get a step up. So sharing the information that you learn is massively important. At the point, Kudini used to boast that he lived in a library because he just bought books all the time. He hired a professional librarian to look after his collection. And he's massively interested in pooling as much information as humanly possible in his brain and honing his physical skills. And he did that really well. Fascinating character. Right, Houdini has fascinated me for a long time. I have a quite large library on Houdini. And I'll put references to all the books that I'm looking at and the websites in the show notes. If you go off to eviltester.com slash show, you should, should find the show notes for this. And the Houdini seance tradition is carried on to this day. It was handed over to Walter Gibson, then a bunch of other magicians. And now the... And now... The Houdini Museum in America um, has uh, essentially an online seance that everyone can partake in. So listen to the seance on archive.org, take part in the Houdini one, join the um, movement and Halloween to try and bring forward Houdini and see if he comes back and speaks to you. And I will end this podcast with the final, very poignant clip from the final Houdini seance where his wife, Beth, wishes him good night. The Houdini Shrine has burned for 10 years. I now reverently turn out the light. It is finished. Good night, Harry. <laughs>